very, very pleased to be here. And as the number one heathen in the city, <laughs> I have to set the tone in light of our priestly manifestations in the beginning. <laughs> and so it seems that the husband and wife were in Jerusalem, and uh, she died. And the funeral director came up to the husband and said, um, you know, we'll send her back to the United States. You can bury her at a nice funeral in the United States, or we'll give you a deal here in Israel holy ground near Jerusalem for 150 bucks. Man scratches his head and says, well, I'm going to take my wife back to the United States. The funeral director says, well, why would you do that? Look at the deal you're getting here. He says, well, you know, several years ago there was a man that died here, and he rose after three days. <laughs> I suppose, uh, I suppose uh, now will go after me now with rather endorsement. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I submit to you today that this is a more auspicious event than listening to the State of the Union address of the President of the United States. Now, I'm talking about the chief executive of the greatest city in the world, a global city who's going to give an address today before the Auspicious City Club, which is the foremost forum for public affairs in the United States. We don't know how lucky we are to have the leadership of our mayor. First of all, he has a passionate love for the city. Secondly, when things do wrong, go wrong, he takes decisive action. And the things that are going wrong in his government, quite frankly, are going, or unfortunately, are going on all over society. The things that are going around are going all over government. And there's no excuse for it. But the point of the matter is when you discover it, you've got to take action and take corrective action and carry on. I don't know of anybody who has a more impassionate belief in the future of our society when it comes to children. Together with him and his lovely wife, Maggie, they have led the cause on behalf of children, unfortunate people, helping them receive a proper education, and what have you. After all, it took an awful lot of guts, I mean guts, and I suppose if you want to say in a more sophisticated way, mental fortitude, I call it guts, to go down to the state legislature and say, look, you don't want to help us, you don't want to do anything, turn the board over to me. And a statement like that, I can tell you, in the city council, in the city of Chicago, was unheard of 20 years ago. To tell you more about what he's done and what he intends to do in the future, it is a great honor and a privilege to introduce to you the chief executive of the city of Chicago, our global city, our mayor, Richard M. Daly. Thank you very much, Alderman. Burton and Paris, thank you, Bert. <laughs> Bert is going to another meeting uh, with Erickson Institute in after school matters, and I deeply appreciate uh, Bert's real commitment, not only the 42nd Ward, but the entire city as elected official. Also, I'd like to recognize, of course, Alderman Pat O'Connor, Alderman Joe Moore, again, uh, all those men and women who are involved in elected office. They sacrifice uh, their time and energy, even away from their family in regards to improvement of their quality of life, whether it's a, a alderman or a state representative or a senator or congressman or a governor, all those that have allow, uh, been allowed to really participate in elected office, I think all of us appreciate uh, their commitment and their sincerity about dealing with all the issues. 
I want to thank uh, Jay Doherty, all the members of the City Club for their great involvement over many, many years in regards to the quality of life. Uh, it is always a pleasure to speak here, but most importantly, this organization has 100 years of basically forming discussions on important issues and then basically allowing the decision makers to move forward as quickly as possible. As we all enter 2007, I think we can all look back, take pride in how much we've accomplished over a number of years. We invested heavily in all our communities, helped build more and more affordable housing and apartments. The quality of life all across the city continues to be improved on a daily basis because we made making education our children as a highest priority. And today, our students are making us proud. It really will reflect what Chicago is all about. It's very simple. There's a line drawn in the city, the state, the nation, the world. And on one side of the line, those who are educated are doing well. On the other side, those that are not educated are in poverty. It's very, very simple. And what is the answer? Is the quality of education that we have to give to our children. And to me, that is the highest priority that we have. This will truly make us a global city as we give that quality education to every child, every opportunity here in the city of Chicago. And that is my dream, that's the ambition, and that's what basically the idea of Chicago is all about. How well can we improve our quality of education for all the children? And to me, that is the key. We embrace new tools dealing with all types of violent crime. We see violent crime basically uh, rising in the nation, but here locally it is going down. And much of the progress, all the progress that we can talk about, all of us to talk about, is basically people working together. CAPS, local school council, aldermen, state representatives, senator, county officials, police, fire department, people involved in libraries, business community, all about basically rebuilding the city. It's all of us coming together, sitting at the table, understanding what we want to accomplish as quickly as possible. And that's what you have to move the agenda forward. It's fine for debates, it's fine to debate it, but after a while, you have to make the decision. And to me, and that's what we have to do. We have worked together. We've had differences, yes, but I firmly believe this city works to together more than the, the state government or federal government. Uh, this city truly works together, and we want to, uh, we're trying to accomplish as much as, uh, as possible and as quickly as possible. And to me, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished. We're very, very active in the business community. It isn't by accident that the buildings are going up. It isn't by accident that any building, anyone's investing in the city of Chicago. It is a co commitment from my administration, from Lori Healy all the way down, as, as well as the business committee, to reinvest in the city. You can go to other cities and they're not investing whether residential buildings, whether businesses, or corporate headquarters in a city, any, city anymore. But here in the city of Chicago, what we have seen is a huge commitment, a planned commitment by the city of Chicago and the planners and developments and the bankers and investors about improving the quality of life here in the city. And this city, it, by, not by accident, but everyone working together, and that is the commitment. What we've seen basically strengthening our economy, but most importantly, our school reform. Millennium Park, the modernization of O'Hare and Midway Airport is a key for our city in the future. Bringing the Olympic and Paralympic Games to Chicago in 2016. In return, we worked hard in City Hall to create the conditions for the business community to basically sit with us. They can prosper and have a healthy business climate means more jobs to the hardworking people of our great city. We've accomplished a great deal here in Chicago because we've embraced the big challenges head on. First of all, school reform. When I took over schools in 1995, I'd be very frank, every, every political consultant told me this is the end of your career because there's no light at the end of the tunnel in regards to any mayor, any public official taking sole responsibility for the public schools. But I knew personally, family gives me the values and gives me an education. And why shouldn't education become the highest priority in state government, in city government? We are the only city in this country to make it the highest priority. After taking over that, when I decided to take over public housing, the largest transformation of public housing in the world. Example, go to Paris, high-rise public housing. It's like closing your eyes 10 years ago. Same problems, gang, guns, and drugs, poverty, in the city of uh, Paris or outside. <clears throat> 
It's unfortunate, it's all over the world. But this city decided, with the city council, all of us, and the business community, decided to tackle the problem of public housing. How to re rebuild souls in public housing since 1999. And you can see the results on a daily basis. Preventing and fighting crime, and most importantly, investing in our communities. And we will continue to do so on all fronts. As we look to the future, even with the progress we have made, many, many challenges lie ahead, especially in Springfield, and that's what I'd like to review today. No challenge is greater than the way the state of Illinois basically funds education. And we have talked about this, this issue not in five years, 10, 15, 25 years. We have a very, very active uh, General Assembly. We know that. Represents all of us here in this room. We have constitutional officers beginning their four-year term. Now, after all the elections we've heard about, now it is a time to seize the opportunity how to basically fund a public education in Illinois. The Chicago Public Schools has improved in many, many ways since all of us took responsibility for the education of our children 12 years ago. But unless we get ed uh, education funding reform as soon as possible, we are concerned that all the progress we've had are threatened. Today, our children are safer in school. Schools in growing communities are less crowded. The buildings and classrooms offer a better learning environment. And thanks to the taxpayers and the members of the city council, we invested over $5 billion, billion of our own money. This is the city of Chicago taxpayers' money in the schools since 1995. We did not make excuses. We're going to wait for the state or wait for the federal government. This city determined that was the highest priority. And our progress is measured, yes, in rising test scores. Almost two-thirds of our elementary school students are meeting state standards, compared with fewer than half in 2005. The attendance is going up every day, and the dropout rate is going down. I just came from a press conference dealing with early inter intervention of juveniles, basically young juveniles, dealing with less crime, not, but nonviolent crime, so that we don't send them a juvenile justice system. We handle them in station adjustments in a special unit with counselors working with the family and the juvenile. So we can prevent them from going into the life of crime as a juvenile, as an adult. Again, the city is in the forefront with the county and state and the federal government and business community working together. Over the last five years, our students have steadily closed the gap in the state of Illinois outgaining students statewide on seven of the eight, uh, eight elementary tests, outgaining the state and the nation on the AC test, which is used for college admissions. The number of high school students enrolled in college level courses have doubled in the last six years. The percentage of graduates going to college is rising every year. Each year, we have added thousands of additional preschool slots, expanded, of course, our after school programs. Each year, we have opened another 15 to 20 new schools in Chicago, all across our city, offering new types of options to parents and students. We will build or rehab another 27 through modern schools across Chicago over the next six years. We will also continue our efforts at the high school level to make sure that everyone who graduates is prepared for college or work and that more, more of them go to some form of higher education. But basically to keep our progress going, we need education funding reform once and for all. I can't accomplish this alone or just the city of Chicago. We are going to need your support, the support of the community and business leaders from across the city and the state and the metropolitan area as well dealing with this issue. We all know the story. Illinois unfortunately relies far too heavily on the local real estate taxes to fund public schools, and far too little on the state, which under our Constitution has a primary responsibility for school funding. According to the latest figures available, Illinois ranks third from the bottom in percentage of school funding that comes from the state. We're at 33%, only Nevada and New Hampshire are lower. The national average is 47% of state funding, 14 percentage points higher than Illinois. Michigan and Minnesota are above at 60% of state funding 
for schools in those two states. When you rely so heavily on property taxes, you put an unfair burden on our se seniors, long-term families, long-term residents, low-income families whose income do not keep up with the value of the property as well as renters. It also penalizes the business community heavily as well. You also penalize students in poor school districts like ours because they never get enough funding from the state to make up the weak local property tax base. And that widens the gap between the rich and poor, the haves and have-nots, which is already much too wide in this country. For years, I've advocated restructuring the system so that the funding burden is taken off local property taxes as rightly assumed by the state of Illinois. Now I have joined, joined my fellow mayors from the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus to speak with a united voice, now think of that, for the first time for school funding reform, and that includes DuPage County, Cook, Will, Kane, Lake, and McHenry. Together, all the mayors, we are seeking a solution that basically guarantees an increase in education funding from year to year, reduces property taxes for education, and enhances accountability by schools all across our state. Given the state's current financial situation, Governor Bogoyevich and the legislature have been generous, increasing funding each year, focused on key priorities like early childhood education. But with costs rising each year, there is little money available for additional steps to meet educational challenges without raising property taxes. And property taxes are already too high in the state of Illinois. Illinois needs education funding reform today. During the course of this legislative session, all parties need to come to the table in a spirit of compromise and determination and a commitment and passion to do the right thing for the children of the state of Illinois. I, am, I was pleased to read last week that members of both houses of the legislature believe now is the time to act as well. For those who worry that our schools spend too easily, I believe that the Chicago Public Schools have demonstrated their fiscal restraint. Each year they have cut administrative costs. Today, less than 5% of the operating budget goes to administration. The other 95% is in the schools and in the classrooms. The Chicago Public Schools and the school systems around the state are still facing financial pressure the rising cost of educating our children, paying for pensions and health care for retirees. So I'm calling upon, once again, everyone who really cares about the future of our children, including those who are here today, to put aside individual agendas, come together to develop one plan to reform our school funding. If we succeed, it will, provide, it will welcome property tax relief both for homeowners, renters, and businesses. As part of this tax reform program, we have to do something during this legislative session about the immediate problem of skyrocketing property taxes caused by sharply higher assessments. I know that I may sound like a broken record on this issue, but I will not give up until all our homeowners and businesses get the relief they need and they deserve. In 2004, Cook County Assessor Jim Houlihan and I won passage of a state legislation that passed a 7% cap on the annual increase in the taxable value of property. That law minimized residential property tax increases, even though the average residential assessment rose 32%. If that legislation hadn't passed, Chicago homeowners would have faced unmanageable tax bills and some would have basically lost their homes. Unfortunately, the legislation doesn't apply to last year's assessment, which, which formed the basis of the property taxes that Chicago would have to pay this fall. Unless the General Assembly passes new legislation soon, residential property taxes will increase an average of 36% this year, according to the Civic Federation. In some parts of the city, they will double, more than double. So I'm calling upon the legislature to renew the 7% cap, to raise a dollar limit on the cap, to basically help those in rapidly improving neighborhoods. 
The old law placed a $20,000 limit on the cap, which allowed some assessment to rise more than 7% a year. The legislature needs to come up with a maximum exemption higher than 20,000 to ensure that homeowners can manage at least the 2006 assessments. Some people have argued that the 7% cap unfairly shifts the property tax burden from homes to businesses. But the fact is that the tax burden has been shifting for many years in the other direction, from businesses to homes. This is because the value of residential property in the city of Chicago has been rising faster than the value of commercial and industrial property. Even if the 7% cap is extended, a commercial properties will receive a median tax cut of 4% this year, according to the estimate of the Civic Federation. I am convinced that, again, if we all work together, we can fashion a property tax system and an educational funding system that's fair to everyone, both homeowners, renters, and businesses. And most importantly, I think we really have to reevaluate the assessment process. An example, on a block, if someone moves in and buys a home for $4 million, we should not start the assessment process on that basis. Someone builds a home. I think this is truly unfair, unfair to improving communities, longtime homeowners or renters in the community. We have to look, besides the cap, at the assessment process here in Cook County. One major issue in Springfield involves guns. One of the reasons why Chicago's crime rate continues to drop is that our police continue to lead the nation in removing, removing illegal guns from the street. In 2006, they've confiscated more than 12,000 weapons, and we lead the nation more than any other city in regards to good police work and basically seizing and confiscating guns. Every time we seize a legal gun, we reduce the probability that someone will be killed, injured, or robbed at gunpoint. Guns were involved in more than 80% of all homicides in Chicago last year. So the way to reduce the murder rate is to continue to get guns off our streets. The best way to do that is to pass common sense, and I call it common sense gun law legislation, that we keep guns out of the hands of criminals who want to commit crime on a daily basis. Our bills would not affect any law-abiding hunter, gun collector, or target shooter. They would make life safer for people who live not only in the cities, but also in the suburban area and small towns that are, unfortunately are experiencing an increasing amount of gun violence. First of all, we're renewing our effort to ban assault weapons, 50 caliber rifles, large capacity ammunition feeding devices. This year, we have seized more, uh, basically, assault weapons in the city of Chicago. And the trend is going up every year, Uzis and other types of weapons that we're seizing. These weapons should be banned not only by the state, but I hope someday by the federal government. They were for 10 years in this country until Congress let the ban expire in 2004. When Congress fails to do its job, it's more important for the states to act as well. Our next bill would limit handgun purchases to one per month. This bill is aimed squarely at gun runners who basically supply the street gangs that are responsible for many of the murders in our city in the metropolitan area. Next, we would require handgun dealers to be licensed by the state of Illinois. This would strengthen the weak federal licensing requirements and would enable the police to trace guns more quickly after they've been used in the commission of a crime. If a gun store, uh, store sold only rifles and shotguns, which are used by overwhelming majority of hunters, it would not need a state license. In 2005, we enacted legislation to close a loophole that allowed people to avoid criminal backgrounds checks by buying guns at gun shows in the state of Illinois. This was a major victory and a step forward in the effort to keep guns out of the hands of criminals, but didn't go far enough. A criminal can still avoid a background check by buying guns from a neighbor who's neither a licensed dealer nor a gun show exhibitor. 
Our legislation will require all gun transfers to be conducted through licensed dealers. Every purchaser would have to undergo a background check. The only exemptions would be transfers between members of immediate family. Finally, we're introducing a bill to increase the number of gun crimes that lead to the suspension or revocation of a driver's license. Right now, you can lose your driver's license for a number of gun-related crimes while driving, including aggravated discharge of a firearm. Our bill would add several other crimes, including unlawful use of a weapon, reckless discharge of a, a firearm. This is part of an overall strategy, an effort to toughen penalties for gun-related crimes. I am sure of you will point out that we have tried and failed to enact some of these bills in previous sessions. But I am more convinced, and I'm sure the gun lobby wishes I would just get discouraged and give up. But that's not going to happen as long as I am mayor. I will continue to fight in Springfield or before the federal government, the legislative body, in regards to common sense gun laws. Our children deserve and our families the safety of all our communities. When hundreds of people lose their lives to gun violence every year, and thousands more, which we never read about, are injured, we have a responsibility to keep up the pressure for sensible and common sense gun laws. People said we would never close the gun show, gun show loophole. We kept trying, we lost, and eventually we succeeded in Springfield. And finally, I know some of you would like a brief update on the status of our bid for the 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games. As you know, the U.S. Olympic Committee will bid for the 2016 Games. It will select either Chicago or L.A. It is expected to decide in April, though it has until mid-September. The International Olympic Committee will select the host city in 2009. Other cities our interest include Madrid, Tokyo, and Rio de Janeiro. We think the Olympic would attract news visitors from around the globe, generate international goodwill, create new businesses and jobs, and of course, neighborhood improvements. Our plan makes use of existing facilities to the greatest extent possible, provides long-term economic, cultural, and athletic benefits for the people of our city and the metropolitan area. I believe the Olympic Games would also be an opportunity to develop a true regional transportation system that not only connects downtown Chicago with the suburban communities, but also do, does a better job of connecting the suburbs with each other, and also connecting the north and south side of the city in the metropolitan area. If you've got a transportation system, everything comes down, everything goes up. There's nothing north and south in the city, west of Ashland, and basically all the way as far as you want to see. We need north and south public transportation. But there's a bigger economic picture to look at as well. Chicago now is a truly a global city, both in character and in commerce. But many of us have noticed when we, when we go overseas, the perception hasn't been quite caught up with the reality. If we want this city to thrive in, in a global economy, we have to do everything we can to raise our city's profile before the international audience. And the Olympic Games gives us that great opportunity. The last three Olympic Games in the United States have returned profits to the cities. And the Olympic movement for sports development in Chicago can be the fourth. The time is right for the city to host the Olympic Games. And that city should only be one city, Chicago. I believe that hosting the Games will be among the most significant events in the city's history will bring very real economic and social benefits to our city. I remember back in the 70s when many people were ready to give up on cities. But just take a look at Chicago today. You can see how wrong they were. Cities can be managed. Our quality of life can improve. Our children can be educated. We've come far since I have been mayor. We have much more to do. As long as we continue to believe in our city and believe in one another, and our power to change things for the better for all the people. I am convinced that Chicago's best days lie ahead of us. I look forward to working with each and every one of you on behalf of our great city. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the mayor has said he take a few questions. So if you've got a question, there is David Cameron, and he'll tell you exactly where the uh, microphone is. The only thing I ask, just state your name and any affiliation you might have. So any questions? Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. My name is Peter Scosi. I'm with the Metropolitan Planning Council. Um, in your length of spring, in your list of Springfield initiatives, um, I didn't hear any mention of transit, and I'm sure you're aware of the needs for transit that are coming up, in the, that are going to be considered by the 2007 General Assembly. Can you tell us what, if anything, you're doing to make that a priority in Springfield? Well, we think we have to get all the parties together, uh, both in the city, suburban, collar counties, set off partisan politics aside and basically do with funding for transportation, both for Metro and PACE and the Chicago Transit Authority. If you look at the Chicago Transit Authority, we basically have more passengers th th than anyone else if you look at what we're serving. And again, the commitment has to be, and we think the Olympics gives an opportunity, again, to move people north and south, which we don't do, with the Olympic movement and investment of the federal government. At the same time, this year, they have to come up with some form of state funding for mass transit. Mayor Ron Gibbs, uh, City Club member. Uh, we know you've been a real national leader with your, your fellow mayors of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, not only on education and gun control issues. Uh, this last session, you introduced federal uh, reform legislation, immigration. And will you be introducing anything new with the new Congress in Washington next week on immigration and uh, your comprehensive approach that you had last year? Well, we, we think we have to do something with immigration. Everybody realizes that and the status of people here in this country. If we don't, then this country really fails. And, and one of the great uh, issues has always been how to get the best and brightest to come here throughout the world. And I'll give you an example. Chicago Public Schools, we have the largest, I think the largest second language program in Chinese in any other public school system in the country we have over 6,000. Where do we have our teachers? We have to bring them over from China. It's amazing. And so that alone basically is an issue always with the federal government. Next year we hope to get another 6,000 enrolled. Where are we going? We have to go over to China. We have to work, we worked out an agreement with the Minister of Education. And we have to work out with Homeland Security, others here to bring basic people across, basically educate our children. Math and science, guess where we're going? We're going abroad because the future of math and science teachers through higher education is going down rapidly. So we have to go abroad to bring math and science teachers. And again, that's how important immigration is or workers in regards to educating our children and doing work. At the same time, uh, we think there'll be a, a proposal in Washington, D.C., as quickly as possible, dealing with immigration reform. Uh, Kathy Posner, not with my hat of City Club, now wearing my hat of Board of Directors of uh, Can TV. Well, first I want to remind everybody that you can see this event Saturday, January 20th on Channel 21, 7 o'clock. We have a relationship between Can TV and City Club. Okay, so why I'm bringing this up is, is that there's fear of legislation that we're going to lose cable access and pay public education and government TV with legislation changes will go away. And I, we need your support as the mayor of- Well, I would, most mayors would fight that uh, in community groups, uh, uh, not-for-profits uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. if that's gonna happen. And we'll find out what Yeah, it but is. the lobbyists on the AT&T and everyone else are so powerful, there's a tremendous chance that we're going to lose cable access. So I just want to let you know that yes. we're worried about it. We need your support. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Barbara Olson, Director of uh, Volunteer and Community Relations for Jobs for Youth Chicago. We were honored enough to have you as one of our speakers last month at our recognition luncheon. I'm wondering how the city can help with organizations such as Jobs for Youth, whose purpose is to assist young men and women from low-income communities to help them learn how to find jobs and to find jobs. And if you figure that there are about a thousand young men and women between the ages of 17 and 24 who neither work nor go to school, there is an untapped source of economic development for our city. And how can we work together to make a difference in their lives? Well, I think it's been a failure of the education system uh, many, many years ago when we told everyone, anyone who graduates from high school, you have to go to college. And if not, you're a failure. And so if you look at the education system, it is all one area, go to college. If not, 
we forget about you. And that's why we're going back to, quote, vocational schools, and we call it basically preparing young people to be certified in industries, this industry, whatever industry you can see in this restaurant, have young people certified when they graduate from high school in a four or five year program, they're certified and they can work in certain industries. Otherwise, again, industries are saying, I spent all my money on education. Where is it? When a young person comes into my office, how, can they take a front or back office? Can they do basic, basic jobs? And that's what the failure of the education system. We started at Austin High School. We're going to go back to vocational, giving people options. Many young people have to work as quickly as possible because of, because of financial problems or family problems. At least they can get a job. What has happened is businesses have walked away saying, I'm not here to prepare people for jobs. The education system is supposed to prepare young people to go on to college or if they want to get a job and a basic job going into any industry. And that's why we're certifying now a number of schools going back to vocational training, basically in order to get a job. If they want to go on to city colleges, if they want to go on to college later on, they can. At least they can get a job. And I call it the failure, not just of this education system, of the entire education system in America. We have not prepared people for jobs. Yes. Mr. Mayor, my name is Raja Khouri. I'm a suburbanite from Evanston, and I work for the OMS. Your speech was wonderful, and it's a great privilege to live in a suburb and work in Chicago. Everything has been so serious this afternoon, but I wish to ask you a question in a lighter vein. Have you made a bet with the mayor of New Orleans? And if so, <laughs> No, we can't say a bet. We can't say that. No. We're going to be wagering again uh, the great uh, uh, hospitality industry here in the city of Chicago, which we very successful Seattle. I won uh, coffee and uh, won some salmon. And uh, we have a variety of products. We really encourage uh, uh, companies here to participate uh, with us. It's really an opportunity uh, uh, to wage uh, uh, the great hospitality and food industry here in the city of Chicago. We're going to do it uh, Friday afternoon with Mayor Nagin uh, from uh, New Orleans. Thank you very much. With that, thank you. Meeting adjourned.